Well, good afternoon and um, hello. Um, my name is Julie Wilson and welcome to the recruiting, enrollment and retention in the next normal part of the Higher Education Leadership Symposium presented by Dynamic Campus, the strategic technology partner for higher education since 2003. I'm Julie Wilson, a senior ERP analyst with Dynamic Campus. I'll be leading today's roundtable as we discuss how small faith-based institutions are growing their enrollments at a time when so many others are struggling to fill their quotas. I'd like to introduce two higher education leaders to share some of their real world approaches at their institutions um, to attract, to find, attract, and keep students in the current environment. Suzanne Davis, is the president of Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois, a role she's held since um, May after having previously served as the university's executive vice president. In that role, Suzanne led the president's executive cabinet and managed reorganization of enrollment, marketing, and international affairs. She also oversaw the finance office, financial aid, and athletics. Thanks for being with us today, Suzanne. Chip Hunter, uh, I'm sorry, Chip Hinton is the Director of Enrollment at the University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota, where he helped lead the institution to three consecutive years of record-breaking growth from 2017 to 2019 and kept enrollment stable this fall at a time when so many others shrank their student populations. Great to have you with us, Chip. Great to be here. We're going to cover as much ground as we can in our time together, but we know we won't get to everything that you're interested in. So we've set aside about 10 minutes or so at the end to answer your questions. You may ask, uh, you may also ask questions anytime during this webinar by typing it into your Q&A window on your screen. Please note your name will be attached to your question and it will be visible to others in attendance. If another participant asks a question you'd like to uh, be answered, just click or press the thumbs up icon and we'll answer the most popular questions as time allows. So let's dive in. How have your institutions used business process improvement to increase enrollment and retention at a time when so many others are struggling? And Chip, I'd like to hand that off to you first. Oh, oh, sure. No problem. The hot seat is still hot, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> it is that that is an interesting proposition. So I'm, I certainly don't want to start off by sounding like uh, we're doing everything perfectly. But uh, we I do work with a group of people who who tend to think ahead, um, even uh, in situations like the one we were all thrown into. Uh, so when I think about the business processes, uh, one of the things that's greatly helped us is um, when you think about standardized testing, a lot, you know, certainly as we're thinking about our undergraduate uh, population, uh, the fact that uh, we went to test optional, that was very beneficial uh, to our process. And, and we're able to um, enroll more students because for those students who hadn't had an opportunity to take the test, uh, we were able to still move them through our process when we were able to make that change. So that test optional status was beneficial to us because it saved time of course, because now we only needed to get the transcripts uh, from um, a high school student. Um, and if they didn't have the test, we didn't have to worry about the test score. But also, um, it allowed us the opportunity uh, to award scholarships in a different way uh, that wasn't combined uh, with a particular test score, as those were optional. Uh, so I thought that was that that greatly helped us uh, to be able to do that. So even out of something bad, we were able to to, to make an improvement and offer more to our students from that way. Are you planning to keep that uh, going forward, the test optional, or just out of curiosity here, I'm sure others have the same question. I know this year, because we, we don't see much of a change yet, we're still in test optional status. I certainly look forward to the day when uh, we can we can be able to look at a, a more balanced approach uh, when we're looking at a student. And that means what they've done day to day uh, from a, a grade point average and transcript standpoint, balanced with what they were able to do uh, in terms of a standardized test. Both of those, I think both of those elements are really important. Um, but 
you know, certainly we've been able to help a great many more students from a financial standpoint as a result of going test optional. Very good. Thanks, Chip. Oh, Suzanne, no would, you, would you like to uh, add on? Sure, I would expound a little bit on what uh, Chip mentioned, and that is we were able to easily go test optional as well. It was something we were already looking at, though, because we had been measuring our um, essays and a rubric uh, for admissions um, based on our values of character and service. So we were able to uh, still do a two uh, prong approach, both the GPA and the response to these essays on very specific things we were looking at in, in short essays. So we were still able to increase uh, or have a pretty quick time for application, uh, but then put those two prongs into our financial aid matrix and also be able to get those packages out a lot sooner. We thought that was very important in 2020 to get financial aid packages out. And so uh, to date, we have awarded more scholarships uh, than we would have normally done by the end of the year. So we already have packages out for our funnel, our um, accepted funnel. And, and so that was a really important thing that, that the business process analysis that we did on admissions and marketing all the way through financial aid and records for registration, one of the things that we really tightened up and had closer line of sight to. Um, the other thing I would mention with business process analysis is unifying uh, all of the various recruitment strategies across campus. And so we actually implemented a new CRM this summer. And I don't know, that I'm, I'm kind of agnostic as to what CRM, but it does need to work for you and your athletic coaches need to understand how to um, uh, work with that, your international admissions, your traditional admissions, everyone needs to be able to work with that CRM. And so uh, being able to do that uh, was very beneficial alongside uh, just some web redesign that went along with it uh, to streamline the application process and make it much easier. So those are some of the things that we've been working on to get better line of sight, better data collection, um, especially on the enrollment side from admissions to marketing, financial aid and records. You know, Susan, I'll, I'll join you in heralding the, uh, the essay. Uh, that certainly in place of being able to have, uh, you know, those uh, standardized tests that it's, it's, we found the essay to be very revealing. And so we use that. I, I actually serve on our academic standards uh, board as well. And so uh, that we, we certainly had some interesting conversations regarding um, uh, those essays. I, I would just follow up as well on your on the CRM piece um, that this couldn't have been a great year to, to be uh, instituting that. We did ours uh, about a year ago. And so I thought that was tough because it happened in the middle of the year. I can't even imagine during a pandemic trying to trying to go to a new CRM. So congratulations on that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it was tough. We I will say, though, if you have things set up wrong or not to your strategy, as difficult as it was to do a new implementation, we went from Salesforce to Slate. Again, I, I'm agnostic on that. It's just, how is it set up for your strategy of what you're trying to do? And, and so it had to be done, even though it was a tough time to do it. Thanks, Suzanne. So, so Suzanne, I'm gonna give you this question first. So uh, Chip doesn't think I'm picking on him. How have you pivoted to digital channels to engage prospective um, students during the pandemic? Of course, we've used more uh, Zoom calls and, and being able to engage students. We've actually done a lot more on social media and not just your typical social, me social media platforms. We've used TikTok and all sorts of fun things that our admissions uh, team is doing to engage students where they're at. Um, we have, uh, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but we have an aggressive testing program on our campus, uh, surveillance testing. And so we're, all of our students, all of our employees are testing twice a week. Uh, and so we actually have been able to control our COVID environment and we're in a fairly small town. So we have actually kept quite a bit of uh, our programming scholarship days uh, visit days, et cetera, we're allowing people to come. And so although we are using digital 
channels for our prospective students. Of course, if they couldn't come to the scholarship day, we had a student from California that uh, still engaged a women in leadership type scholarship remotely. And so we made sure not to disadvantage anyone, uh, but we had a lot of uh, a lot of participation in our scholarship days face to face because so many colleges were not. And, and I would say uh, with us uh, not uh, really understanding or knowing how this was going to go last spring, it caught us at a time when we would do um, what we call SOARs, and SOARs are student orientation, advising, and registration sessions. So this, these are uh, whole Saturdays where our students would come. Um, about 25% of our expected class at a time on four different uh, Saturdays during the spring um, and be able to come and get their orientation. And, and, our, and, the, and I think the biggest thing they take away is our Benedictine hospitality that we're kind of famous for here in North Dakota. And, it, and we weren't able to do it, uh, you know, just because we didn't know what was going to happen next or, or what the environment was going to be like. So this gave us an opportunity to set up what is normally a full day of uh, you know human interaction and do it digitally. And I was just afraid, I have to be honest with you, because that's so important to uh, the way a potential freshman student is gonna see the university um, that I, you know, we're a little bit apprehensive about it. But we were able to, to do um, really wonderful videos of our esteemed campus president, uh, Monsignor Shea, and some of the other uh, luminaries from our president's council. Uh, you know, to, to do those video setups. We used uh, Zoom and Microsoft Teams uh, to be able to, where they, where they do the registration piece of it, where they get an, every student have an opportunity to sit down with their, um, their, their, uh, their major chair or somebody within that major and set up their schedule and get registered. Um, we were able to do that on calls. So of course, there are a lot of logistics involved in setting up these tiny, uh, you know, meetings and, and, and keeping this thing going, not to mention all the paperwork that would go into this. Um, just phenomenal. But we, we work um, a lot with the folks that we have on campus. And, and I'll say Dynamic Campus helped us out a lot uh, as well in terms of being able to set up the right platforms and get everything going uh, so that, that those days that we did, we were able to get set up just went beautifully. Um, so I, I was very, I was very impressed with uh, the way we were able to do uh, our student orientation, advising, and registration sessions. That's good. That's um, I've heard lots of stories of uh, people doing those online orientations and how they're nervous at first because not like we've always been doing, but um, definitely um, worthwhile doing. I've, I've heard a lot of schools say that. So how has your student retention um, been affected by your COVID response? It, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's been rough. I mean, um, th that part of it, you know, I, I can help control uh, the recruitment um, of, of new students. But, you know, so, you know, there are a large number of students who were just completely afraid at the, uh, at the beginning of this. Um, I think we did everything we could um, in terms of um, uh, managing through what our normal retention rates would be. Uh, but, but sure, that, that, was, that was rough. It was rough from the standpoint of when the, the pandemic happened and students having to leave school. That was rough for the faculty and staff because we really value, of course, being on campus and, and, and dealing with our students that way. Um, and, and, you know, getting students adjusted to to doing online classes for the remainder of, of the semester. And, and an area that we don't think about all the time, but it's definitely a business process, is the billing that's associated with that. You know, that's, that's a critical part of the customer service uh, is how, how does the billing go now that they left in the middle of the semester and, and now it's time to get ready for the next year. Um, and, and so, you know, I thought we did um, a wonderful job of reaching out to our students um, and, retaining as many of them as we could. We certainly in the middle of our process last year, even from a recruitment standpoint, had plenty of students that said to us, no, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna stay closer to home. And so uh, for, just from recruiting new students as well as um, our existing students, you know, we had our challenges there. 
So we had a little bit different situation and our retention was up substantially, even from our best case scenario that we had projected, we were 5% higher uh, in the fall um, from the spring semester than, than what we had even thought possible. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it, I think Chip, what you were saying about billing, we did partial refunds that the, the parents really felt were uh, high integrity the way we went about it. Uh, because we did have to, of course, go remote in March. But then uh, in July, we started securing a partnership for the saliva-based test that it only takes 30 seconds to complete. <laughs> well, if you're really good at it, uh, like I have now uh, been practiced on, but, you know, two to three minutes. And, and, and so we were able to really push out the word that we were going to be testing twice a week and, um, working with the University of Illinois in a partnership that we uh, had developed through the spring because we had international students uh, from Wuhan that were already um, you know, telling us what was happening back in January. So we rolled out a comprehensive plan on COVID and I really think we had a great response to that. Um, in addition to having higher than we thought fall to spring, uh, retaining of or spring to fall uh, retaining of students, we also uh, are projecting based on registration numbers, uh, a very good fall to spring as well, um, with the intent to return surveys showing 93% intend to return um, and 40 new students that we typically wouldn't see at the spring uh, start date. So I do think our COVID response and the comprehensive nature of it, both from a billing perspective and how we handled the uh, student transition to online. And then right. also from the perspective of uh, seeing a little bit below the iceberg, not uh, waiting for the situation to happen, rather getting out in front of the data for COVID numbers and uh, making some promises that we would keep the semester as normal as possible, which we have. We even right. returned after Thanksgiving. Um, and, and, and keeping that promise has really been integral. We even are playing some basketball games with D1 teams because not many D3 teams are playing and D1 doesn't have enough to play. So I think just being true to uh, trying to create as much normal experience as possible for the students has very positively impacted our retention. I would say um, you brought up a point at the end that I was going to ask about in terms of athletes. One of the highlights, though, uh, of our year is the, um, the number of, of athletes who, who did return, even um, without having any real knowledge prior to the start of the semester, whether or not we were going to have fall sports. And, and even so, as we're looking at what's going to happen with our spring sports. So I think the, the retention there, especially with that particular segment, has been very good. Uh, from a recruitment standpoint, uh, the athletes were really excellent as well um, to close out our 2020 recruitment cycle and, and uh, of course, um, are doing very, very well again at the start of this uh, recruitment uh, season that we're in now. So that's been a bright spot for us. Thank you. We, uh, we have a question that kind of fits right in with um, what you're talking about as far as moving from a in-person in environment to a... Um, to a online presence. Um, so, so what are the most uh, important recruitment and retention lessons you've learned uh, regarding the role of IT outside of just keeping the machines running? You talked a little bit about the billing issues and I'm sure there were other little, little things that you saw that needed to, to be addressed. I think having line of sight, uh, to all of the processes going on across your institution is imperative in a crisis. So it's everything, right? So you've got to be able to project your finances to decide what to do with refunds. You've got to be able to project uh, your new student numbers and your returning numbers to make solid decisions on what's really happening in terms of student satisfaction and uh, how they're engaging the classroom. And, and, and obviously, as you think about, um, we just went through a program 
uh, return on investment kind of analysis uh, and having the data of who's in what classes and, and just being able to really streamline all of your operations and turn them to a, a, a student focus um, and, and their satisfaction as they engage those systems is imperative in a crisis. And that is the unsung hero, I think, of IT um, that makes that possible when you're looking at so many different platforms, you know, whether it's your CRM, your, uh, we use Genzabar, other financial tools, other. And so the more that you can have line of sight in a centralized fashion, uh, the better. Okay. I would have to agree with uh, with with your perspective there. Um, I think uh, for us, it's it's making sure, as always, that um, our our IT team is on board with everything uh, that we're trying to get done. And uh, it's but one of the things that's going on right now is just the technological upgrade um, in our lecture rooms, so that uh, there, regardless of which room you're in, it's going to look very very consistent. Um, with the ability to stream live um, any lectures that you might have. And so that the sound and the quality of that is such that uh, if you have to do the lecture um, and there's students there, they get um, a similar um, experience as if you were doing it um, at, you know, from home. And, and those are not the kinds of things we've been thinking about before the pandemic, you know, because everybody would be on campus and you'd show up as you need to. So, uh, you know, just having IT around to help plan for that and uh, making sure that, again, like, um, like I heard uh, Suzanne say before, uh, is involved with the admissions process um, and, and making sure that we can uh, send video messages and those kinds of things using, um, we use Slate as well, uh, using Slate to be able to do that and, and, and make uh, everyone's life um, a, a bit smoother even during uh, these, uh, you know, uncertain times, so. So move into the next question. And I believe it's um, Suzanne's turn, maybe. Sure. I've, I've lost track. I, I, I kind of <laughs> lost track. But you guys have been great. Thank you so much. Um, what has been your enrollment trend over the last few years? And what plans do you have for enrollment growth in the near term? And there's a question in the Q&A about whether or not you intend to keep some of those digital um, tools that you developed during this crisis as part of that plan. Yeah, so I would say, you know, we are still experiencing the downward trend of, uh, of the marketplace. We're in, um, you know, kind of a, a rural area, uh, 45 minutes outside of St. Louis. And, and I think, um, I, I think, you know, we're not going to uh, be completely unscathed from the COVID factor. So I just don't, I don't want to create that perspective. I think uh, it has been difficult, but what it did cause us to do was really hone in on what was working and drill, drill down on our uh, core values and why we do what we do. And so I do anticipate in uh, engaging these same methods going forward. So uh, test optional, I, I, I think as Chip said, there's a, there's a place for test scores, standard, standardized test scores. But we really found that when we analyze these short essays, that it needs to be a factor. And our admissions counselors could actually score those essays, work with the admissions committee. And we were gaining confidence on what, you know, it was just an easy one through five scale. We were gaining confidence on, on our rubrics and, and how those students scored on that. And I think we'll keep that, uh, not just in our application process, but work even more with those uh, indicators for character and service as we do our scholarshiping uh, processes, especially with, especially with the larger scholarships and early awards. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that became so clear is uh, because athletics was on pause at first this semester, uh, we turned them all into more broad-based recruiters. And so there was no more just, you know, we talked to this segment in California for our basketball athletes or football team, if you've got those relationships with those schools, you are now 
an admissions recruiter for yeah. other students. And we, I think we'll keep those athletic admissions uh, coordination. And they also figured out which parts need to be done by athletics and, and how could that uh, just be done in house in that in that area instead of be a tax on the admissions counselors. So really, the admissions counselors could focus on just non athletes, <laughs> and, and getting that kind of uh, synergy was important. And I think we'll continue on with a lot of that re recruitment strategy. I, I think it's it's helped us do better than other schools in our area. For enrollment, even though we are seeing the downward trends of enrollment generally. No, uh, you know, you, you sort of mentioned in the intro um, sort of how wonderfully things went when I first got to the University of Mary. And I almost cringe um, at that because, you know, we, we'd experienced these years where uh, we'd have waiting lists uh, for people to get in. And, and I can tell you that as wonderful as uh, last year was because we were able to do far better than we ever thought. And, uh, you know, be, I think a lot of it has to do, if you haven't, if you've been listening pretty closely, with Suzanne and I can, can share with you is that by being able to be open and still be able to have the option of having classes, uh, that has meant a lot to recruitment because as you know, young people are tired of being online and doing all their homework uh, online. And, and so uh, part of what I think has helped our recruitment efforts is that uh, they know that we're open and, and we're you know completing a full semester and those kinds of things. But, but our, we, we are really smart. I, I work with um, a group of people uh, that, that as we sit down and plan for the recruitment year, taking into consideration um, how well we've done, how well we expect to do. Uh, you know, I, I expect us uh, even this year uh, to, we're about four and a half, five percent ahead of where we were um, at this point last year. Um, and so I would assume that uh, looking at the way things have gone and some of the um, the new things that we've learned will we'll probably trend upwards to about four to five percent above uh, where we were uh, in previous years and ahead of where our goals are going to be. So I'm pleased about that, but a lot of that comes from some of the things that we learned last year. Um, you know, I think before uh, when you have so many people on a wait list, you don't worry about uh, this enrollment funnel and what's going on at every phase because it seems natural that somebody who applies is also going to want to send in their information as fast as possible to get accepted. Whereas last year, we were really bright about um, creating some excitement through the funnel. So we'd have promotions all, all the way through the funnel. Um, I, one of the things that I, our students really love are these crazy, you marry socks. So if you apply by this particular time, you get these bright orange and blue socks that don't <laughs> ask me about it later, I'll share them with you, it's just, just ridiculous. But uh, realizing that it's, it's, it's about dealing with um, the customers that you have right there in front of you um, and addressing uh, what you are doing towards them at all times. So it'll be different next year, um, but we'll still figure out a way uh, how to get through it. Um, you know, I, again, uh, I can't tell you enough how, uh, while we were worried about having to switch to using Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams, as it were, sometimes, what we found is it is so convenient and flexible for those folks that are outside of the recruitment process when they need to. Uh, so, you know, we did stop doing on-campus visits for just about six to eight weeks until we got a better feel for it. And when we came back on campus for, for, for on-campus visits, um, we still had faculty and staff because it's during the summer that weren't quite there yet, but we could schedule a, a, a video conference with, call with them. I think that's wonderful to, to be able to give the student the maximum amount of flexibility and convenience um, and exposure to our academic team. It works so well for them uh, that even if they're doing a visit on Friday, but it's easier for you to connect, connect with your faculty member or program uh, person on a Thursday or even a Saturday, we set it up and it works so much better that way. So I really like that, the flexibility of that. Very good. So how can financial aid be used earlier on to attract and retain students? I'm smiling because I, I, that one. I, I'm going to say, why don't we just let Julie answer that one, Suzanne? Because I know she, <laughs> she has the answer to that. I have a feeling she has the answer to that. I, you know, one of the things that we had to do uh, is um, look at um, how we could get our, uh, our, our population of students 
to file their FAFSAs earlier. Um, that way we'd have a real assessment as to um, what we were able to offer them. And, and in, our old, in our process before the pandemic, they kind of did, they, they kind of took their time doing that. Um, but uh, we were able to offer a scholarship uh, that's based only on if you file your FAFSA, if you should even be considered for it. Um, and so that, that helped us be able to get students uh, and, their, and their parents and families to file the FAFSA sooner. Uh, we get a lot of students that say, hey, I'm not gonna file because um, you know, I'm not gonna get anything anyway. Yes, but there is this other scholarship that's out there, you know, it, and it had to do with the pandemic, so I'll be honest about that, but it gives them you know, hope that they'll get actually something no matter what. So it, it was very enticing and we we're able to do that. Uh, but I, I definitely think that uh, in order to do what we do, the financial aid segment has to be a part of that and it has to be even sooner than what we're, we're doing right now. So we can work on that even still. Okay. And Suzanne, you talked, you talked a lot about um, getting those financial aid packages out earlier and uh, what an impact you thought that made on your sure. bringing your class in this year. Um, so can you talk a little more about how you got that push? Yeah, we, we just keep pushing for more. So last year we tried to get it earlier by the end of the year. We wanted to see the first set of uh, financial aid packages go out. Uh, and this year I, I moved it up uh, to, I wanted to see them go out by November 20th and, and we did. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, we have been, we, we keep upping our date on our financial aid office and they have risen to the occasion. So the reason I think for us why it's important is uh, we have a large scholarship uh, pool for uh, what we call Panther Preferred students. And there's segments of that for different types of leadership, but it's all for character and service, again, towards our values and mission statement. And so um, we have women in leadership, uh, we have uh, Mosaic for diverse scholars, and we have uh, what's called McAllister's for high achieving academic. It, but in all these scholars, there's a, over a hundred spots available for these scholarships. So um, they run about 19,000 um, to 19,500, for example, in what we're awarding in these scholarships. So the reason it's so important is you can't have those large scholarships hanging out there for long. Uh, you want to get them out early, at least in my opinion. And so yeah. we have our scholarship days and we really encourage that early deposit so that we're, we have a critical mass of our students uh, deposited for those scholarships and then essentially they can end um, so that we don't get into this um, package war uh, for students who maybe aren't as qualified. So we try to get our high, high quality students in early. And because that's such a, a critical part of our strategy culturally for retention as well, um, we have to get those financial aid packages out early so that then if those spots aren't all filled, we can figure out whether to extend it, et cetera. Because students and their parents can't make a decision a, a true decision. And really the deposits are, are kind of less important now. It's a small amount of money. And yeah. so we want to see true decisions early so that we can decide how to flex on those big scholarships. So um, one of the things they've talked about, you know, I've been attending the Federal Student Aid Conference this year. And one of the things they talked about was that um, the returning students are filing FAFSAs at record numbers, but the new students, the new freshmen um, students um, coming in from high school just are not, it's, it's down probably almost 20%. So what are you doing as part of your recruitment process to encourage that FAFSA filing? Um, I know if I used to, I, I've worn so many hats, but one of the hats I used to wear was I worked in a high school and I helped with that FAFSA um, completion process. Um, but with the students largely at home now, they're not getting that, that, that constant 
you know, nagging from somebody at the campus that it's time for you to file your FAFSA. So I think that's probably going to be falling more on the colleges and universities at this point. So do you have a plan or have you, um, have you looked at ways to strongly encourage that FAFSA filing for those high school uh, students early? Uh, absolutely. We have uh, a program called Taxes Schmaxes. Uh, that didn't come from me. Uh, that comes from our director of financial aid. And so okay. that name is so catchy. Uh, so what we do is um, we, it's, we send out a postcard. We mail that uh, to all of uh, the high school students in um, North Dakota and, and a couple of our other surrounding states. Um, and it's catchy. And so everybody sees that. And we, of course, promote you know, the benefits of filing uh, as early as possible. And then um, every month we send out a digital uh, form of tax or smaxes to everybody that um, is in our inquiry bin or, or higher so that they know uh, as part of the process, you know, you'll need to, to file and file early. Um, and, and so those, those things are help, helpful as well. One of our um, goals uh, so that it's not something that's just left on the back burner. One of the goals for our reps this year from a performance standpoint is to get 85% of their overall um, accepted students uh, to get them to apply for the FAFSA as fast as okay. they can. So we, we, we wanna make sure everybody keeps their finger on the pulse of that one, it's pretty important. Similarly, we've uh, made it kind of our responsibility uh, to help uh, students and their parents file the FAFSA and provided um, you know, counseling with our financial aid office on Zoom uh, on um, different avenues. And so, so we've had to be more proactive in that. Good, good. So how have you used data to make strategic decisions during COVID? Um, I think it's Suzanne's turn this time around. So we have run over 20,000 tests on our campus for about uh, 900 testing bodies, <laughs> both of employees and uh, students. And um, of that uh, 20,000 tests, we've had 75 unique positives. And the reason I, I'm going into this detail is because it's showing the data beneath the iceberg for uh, COVID because of all of those, only a handful would have self-reported symptoms um, and really only one had severe symptoms. So 75 positives and only one. Um, and so it, it's just speaking truth to the situation that I think has been very important uh, because our campus is has gained uh, more confidence um, because data casts out fear. <laughs> um, when you can have actual numbers of what's going on uh, and, and asymptomatic means, you know, you're, you're doing the isolation and you're doing the contact tracing. We did very aggressive contact tracing. So we have quarantine. And although it's hard on those students to do isolation and quarantine because we have so much data as to what's happening and how that could affect the surrounding community, again, going back to our values, not wanting to, to do things that, uh, you know, would put our community in jeopardy. Uh, it, it, they have now self-policed. I mean, we have had no issues with compliance. Uh, we have great compliance because the students see, because they see the data, <clears throat> they now are saying, hey, I wanna get tested before I go home. I need to know my results so that I don't impact a family member. Um, you know, I want to stay here over Thanksgiving break um, to be in quarantine because I'm concerned that I, you know, I, I have been, um, you know, to different places. And, and so we've had that response and it, we've only had that response because we've uh, been so uh, diligent about the data, even the data that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, and, and for us, um, even before uh, we had the fall semester, we, we certainly wanted everyone to be aware uh, of what the conditions would be like, especially as the campus was open and classes were in session and, you know, for our, our, uh, our dining restaurant um, and, and being able to have access to that. Uh, there, we, we wanted to make sure that the students had um, 
committed to filling out waiver forms. And they understood exactly what that meant in terms of the protocol. Uh, then once they'd arrived on campus, everybody understood that there were different statuses based on uh, the data that, um, that we've been able to collect um, in terms of where uh, we would be um, if for some reason, um, you know, there was a, a spread and we've been blessed not to have uh, that. And so I think it's, it's just that, that understanding of what to expect when they got to campus. Um, we, we've had wonderful participation uh, from the student body in terms of uh, the social distancing, the wearing of the mask. Um, you know, we don't have um, a lot of renegade students who want to do, you know, <laughs> not do the things that they're supposed to do. So we've been blessed in that sense. We certainly have had um, our, our, our cases and we've dealt with those. I think sometimes just another student hearing about what someone else had to do uh, in isolation is, is um, remedy enough in terms of them not wanting to do what they're supposed to do uh, for this. So uh, it, it, it certainly has guided the way uh, we do everything on campus um, in terms of um, outside events or, or things that we are able to do on campus. So uh, we pay close attention to that and make sure weekly that people are informed of what the current status is and, and where we're going. So uh, just it's about everything we do, I think, um, on campus. Very good. And Suzanne, I heard that you have quite the um, visionary uh, saliva test pro protocol and program at your school. So um, it seems to be working for you real well. Um, eventually, the pandemic will end. God help us all, right? Um, how many of the adjustments that you've made during this year do you expect to carry forward once um, personal connections can resume? I, I, I think a great many of the things that we've, we've discussed today, let, let's talk about uh, some of the, the advances we've made digitally, uh, the, the increase in access to um, the student portal that, that has a lot of the documents that can be uh, completed and filled out and, and sent back as a, as a student is moving through the process versus having to wait for an in-person SOAR. Um, whether, you do, whether we do um, the same percentage of in-person SOARs as we'll do digitally, that's another area. Uh, we found some students who really are interested in coming to the University of Mary don't wanna come back twice if they live you know, in a faraway state. And so, you know, doing it digitally is a great way uh, to be able to accommodate uh, their, their needs from a, a financial travel uh, standpoint. So, so those, those are, are always good things. Um, you, you heard me mention the, the flexibility that uh, we're able to, to give to our process by not having to have somebody do everything in person. So I, I definitely see that, that there are some, some really good things that we'll want to use um, uh, forevermore in, in our process. And, and, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to that. I think some of those things were, were very, very necessary. Yeah. Suzanne? Definitely. Yeah, definitely the uh, access to um, content. We, we now you know, know it's just a given that you have to, in addition to having the face-to-face -face experience, also be able to uh, transition for students who are in need, not just because of quarantine and isolation now, but uh, they need to be able to access that content so easily on what we have now desire to learn. So they're able to, you know, watch it in live stream, the class time, and obviously the professors now have been more diligent about loading everything into um, our desire to learn portal for the students. And so I think it's going to really help uh, student or faculty understand that those things are necessary. That is just how uh, we need to continue to serve our our students. Um, I think the other thing that will remain for me, at least, is a flattened structure for line of sight and and um, again more. Uh, accessible data for crisis response, because you don't know what the next crisis will be. And so you don't want to wait for it to have all of those operations streamlined, um, and you don't want to uh, not know it from a centralized perspective so that you can you can orchestrate all of the all of the response because as we've said several times things are so interconnected there's so many synergies across campus that we just don't take advantage of often and this has caused us to 
uh, really explore those synergies, both from a technology standpoint of all the various platforms we were using, but also just from a human resource standpoint and, and how we could work better together. I gave athletics and admissions as just one example, but there's so many more examples of that. We've gotten more articulations done uh, with, you know, the synergies we have between academics and the records office and, and um, even uh, alumni as they reach out. So it's just been amazing to see the synergies that exist across campus. Um, so that flattened structure and that ease of access to data is is gonna is going to remain for us, um, and and I think just you know moving uh, for, forward the other thing that that this has allowed us to do is um, uh, think more carefully about what is our unique uh, niche or um, value proposition that we're offering. Uh, as an institution um, and honing in on that from a admissions perspective and everything that we do uh, will continue as well. I've heard from uh, some schools that finally the faculty are using the LMS, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, so even though this, this, this was actually a you know, I wouldn't want to have to do this again, right? But there are some things that have come out of it. And I've heard that from um, a number of institutions and from my little financial aid cabal, students doing more online, um, doing more um, as part of their self your self-service platform, whatever that is. And so um, I'm hoping, I, I hope anyway, that some of that stuff stays, um, stays and some of the redundancies, the silos that we had before that you talked about, Suzanne, that those are all kind of disappearing now, um, that those don't show up again, just because that's the way we've always done it, right? The scourge of every existence. So we do have um, a little time left and we do have some questions here. And so the most popular question is this one. What are the best tools you have used to build um, the uh, student engagement, student faculty, your, your campus engagement? So one thing, and I was gonna mention this actually on things that won't change when the pandemic ends. Um, we knew that onboarding uh, students in the fall, it, we had all of these new regulations and things that they had, the procedures they had to follow. And, and it became obvious that it's one thing to come up with, you know, our COVID manual. It's another thing for the students to engage it. And so we uh, had our uh, student government team come back early. Uh, they did some uh, different marketing things for us, pushed out different messages on social media, did videos and, and help us actually frame the message, all the signage that we did for our testing center. They uh, helped, you know, they called taking the easiest test on campus. So it was just all from their perspective. And right. we made them uh, a routine part of our monthly, what I call president's council meetings. And uh, it, it just changed the way we looked at it because it's one thing to theoretically envision <laughs> how uh, this is going to work through the semester. It's another thing to get the students' opinions um, across the organization. So, so that will not change for us. And I think that was huge for student engagement because they built the culture uh, that frankly, they knew was going to have to be possible for us to continue face to face. So they right. own that piece of it. Interesting. And, and so for us, um, uh, one of the things I think helped us achieve the recruitment numbers we were able to get to um, this, this late spring and, and summer uh, was that, that our faculty members from, you know, the upper reaches of, a, of an academic school um, all the way to all the faculty members helped with outreach to our potential students. So, you know, the deans might have done a video that they, a burst that they sent out, but then maybe the program chairs followed up with um, email or, or texting um, so that they can, uh, they can start conversations from there. And so Slate actually allows you to, um, to facilitate text in a much easier way. And so um, we were able to do that. That, that certainly helped. 
Um, and uh, we saw the benefits of that when, when, the, when the students were able to engage directly with um, their faculty members. And it sounds like both of you sound like uh, your faculty are helping quite a bit more with uh, recruitment and retention um, activities more now than before. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and they seem to enjoy it, but it, you know, it also uh, gives them a measure of control about how well um, you know, they're doing from a recruitment standpoint. Uh, they, they, have, they feel like they have some skin in the game, which is, which is great with me. Right. That's good. That's really good. Um, Cause that was like pulling teeth most of the time getting <laughs> faculty to, to participate in some of those recruitment activities. So it's good to hear. Um, how are you measuring student engagement outside the classroom and in person, um, you know, with less face-to-face -face time, how are you measuring that? So we have done a, um, and it seems like we should have done this much sooner than now, but um, this fall we have done shorter uh, surveys of students about to just get a kind of a temperature check throughout the semester as to how they were feeling about COVID protocols and response, how they were feeling about um, scheduling, like what they wanted for spring break, um, what, uh, how, you know, food was working in the dining commons because most of it was taken to go uh, when we were in the red zone. Um, we had different zones uh, and, and at those different zone levels was what the dining common service was. Anyway, so it was just these pulse checks throughout the semester in jot form and we had remarkable response, uh, which actually led to our decisions. Um, again, I, like I said, we came back after Thanksgiving break uh, that was in response to a pulse check where a good number of our students, and they wrote really long explanations <laughs> as to why they wanted to come back. And, and it was almost yeah, tear jerking yeah. because you saw yeah. the situations they were in and maybe their lack of technology that they had at home, internet access yeah. or otherwise. And we got so much rich information about what our students wanted from those pulse checks. Kind of want to follow up there. So, so you talked a little bit about some of the students are like, look, I can't stay, you know, three days, fish and family stink, I got to go back to school, right? So um, that's, that's going to help you identify some of your at risk students. What other kind of um, ways are you able to assist your at risk students? Um, so we um, have given them a direct access to what we call a center for teaching and learning. Um, and it's, it's a part of our IT team, um, but it's also most closely connected to our, our faculty. And so that we know what's going on in the classroom. And in fact, just recently they did a check of all the technology, like when the faculty started classes, again, just to make sure that every class is, is working the way we said it would work. Um, and uh, so I think that that's actually been very helpful to have staff members checking in with faculty and then reminding them to check in with students. Um, okay. That's one way. Okay. No, I, you know, I, I certainly um, would, would have to concur. It's just about what you what measurement you would use to check in with the students and see what they think um, along the way, um, and you know uh, that that is something certainly that um, we need to continue to look at in terms of the, the the short bursts, the surveys, just to check in and see you know what are, what are they thinking of the student experience. So, so it looks like I only have two more questions left here. So let's see what's going. On. Has this changed the outreach recruiting specifically to adults who can be served better in an online environment? So has this changed your recruitment? Because um, you're both still holding on, on campus um, classes. Have you found that you've had online students um, decide, you know, maybe I'll take class on in person or vice versa? Is, 
what what has that looked like? Interestingly to me, uh, we've had an uptick in um, our uh, traditional freshmen who don't want to wait for the fall to get uh, started, but they want to start this spring. So um, that's been um, just an unusual uh, a bit of change. And it's because they're, they're dealing with the environment um, and they, they like it. There are some students out there that absolutely like um, being able to work in an online environment and learn in an online environment and don't want to wait, uh, waste any more time. So if they're, they're finished um, in December, wanting to start with us uh, this spring, which is, um, I would say that's up about 20% over what we would normally expect, so. Yeah, that was the 40 number I was referencing. That was, uh, we're up 40. <laughs> and I was surprised by that as well in our spring numbers, the early starts. Uh, so that has happened. And I think those students intend on um, coming face to face uh, as soon as possible too. We definitely have noticed an uptick on our online enrollment uh, during COVID as well. Um, and I think we've also noticed more students who now assume that the flex is a possible, right? So I right. can go face to face and now I can go online. I could do two classes online and do two face to face. Now it, it poses our operational challenges, but I think, hey, it's, it's just a reality that it's going to be more assumed in the marketplace out there that those kinds of things can happen. It's true. Well, we, we did this right because I only have one question and I only have time for one question. So that's good. <laughs> so what specific uh, recruitment retention challenge required IT involvement and how was it addressed and what are the long-term implications after COVID? And I think you talked a little bit about this earlier, but maybe uh, something more concrete or more specific they're looking for. Analyze everything and there might be an <laughs> IT solution for it. So I always ask at every meeting, what questions don't have answers at GU? Uh, because there are all sorts of things. Your people know what issues are out there and uh, you should always be asking them at every level of the organization what things do not have answers currently um, that you're seeing. And when you hear that, then immediately think, okay, how is there a systematic approach to this question? And <laughs> that usually involves IT. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think it makes sense, but, but perhaps so obvious uh, that even though we've always had online divisions, our graduate programs, are online, our, our grad and undergraduate programs are online. Um, but when we had to move our traditional freshmen um, to, to mostly online last spring, yeah, that, I think that's when, uh, you know, our, our, our IT department, um, you know, realized, okay, we have to, in, in a very short period of time, increase our bandwidth, be able to, to handle um, all of that, that, you know, in just a, a short period of time. And I think they did terrific work. But again, that could only have happened with uh, the right communication and the right organizational structure to be able to allow that to happen in a short period of time. So, but, but I would definitely say that just being able to make that change and do it so effectively so that we could keep students uh, engaged, wonderful during a terrible period of time. Well, I appreciate everything um, you guys offer to not just me, because uh, I'm a one trick pony, right? I do financial aid and that's all I harp on. <laughs> and that's all I talk about 24 hours a day. They'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but you informed me quite a bit and I don't have any students in college right now, but um, I imagine that if I, if I did that your um, information would just be much more comforting to me as a parent. So thank you so much for sharing um, your experience and your knowledge and um, everybody else on the call. I, I hope you'll reach out to uh, Chip or Suzanne if you have questions or want to duplicate or replicate or as we say in financial aid, we just steal everybody's stuff, whatever sounds good, because that taxes smashes smash 
that's that's gold right there. I can't wait to use that. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna end this session, and it looks like we've um, so we finished here. And I just want to thank you again for your time and um, your knowledge. It's just it's just thank thank you thank you so much. Um, as we touched on briefly, Dynamic Campus has underwritten the production of this roundtable set session and the Higher Education Leadership Symposium. And this virtual event offers one more free uh, roundtable tomorrow, just like this one, focused on how to thrive as a faith-based institution today. To register or to find out more, just visit dynamiccampus, all one word, dot com, and click on the green banner at the top of the page. Thanks so much for all your time today and your participation. Um, I really do appreciate everybody. I'm a little rusty from my presentations from not having to go anywhere for quite a while, but you guys made me look like a rock star, so I appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Be, be blessed and be safe, everybody. Yes.